Sio, Hosiju, hello my relatives. I bring you greeting from the Katua Band of Cherokees, my people, the Colorado chapter of the American Indian Movement, of which I'm a part, from Gwarthi Las, otherwise known as Leonard Peltier, who tonight as I speak to you sits in a cage to federal prison Leavenworth, Kansas. Not for anything, anyone, including even his prosecutor at any point in the last 15 years, perhaps more, has been prepared to say they actually believed he did, but rather as a symbol of the arbitrary ability of the federal government of the United States to repress the legitimate aspirations to liberation of indigenous people within its claim boundaries right here in the good old USA. Having said that, I'd also like to say that I'm speaking for none of them tonight. I'm speaking as Ward Churchill, not as AIM, not as Cherokee, not as a spokesperson for Leonard Peltier, but just as a human being to human beings, straight up and to the issue. The event was Build Pacifism as Pathology, which is the title of a book that I did in collaboration with Ed Mead and Mike Ryan. And I'm assuming that there's a good number of people in here who have already read the book. And I'm also aware that those of you who have not certainly can. As Ramsey pointed out, it's on sale right out there. It looks just like this. As you can tell, it's not a terribly large book, and so it's not a terribly long read. I therefore do not propose to recapitulate what it is verbatim that's in the book. You can follow the baseline arguments by reading the text. And there have been some events that have occurred since we originally planned this particular event. They occurred in September on the 11th, as a matter of fact, which changes the context of a lot of what I might have said in any event. I'm going to just go full bore in that particular direction, engage in a little challenge. What I want to do is basically line out an argument here as rapidly as possible and turn it into exchange. Comments, which do not extend to speeches, okay, Q&A, spit wads, brick bats, whatever, Nonviolent things might be coming my way as a result of what it is that I might say. See where we end up. So that's the general drill that's on hand. What is it that the citizenry of the United States and even its most progressive formations has engaged by way of applying even a break, much less bringing to a halt this pattern of wholesale criminality engaged in by its governor? And it's not simply this abstraction of criminal behavior or comportment. It's not simply a posture. It's not something that we sit there and say, well, that is wrong in some abstract moral sense. No, the nature of the criminality in which the United States engages, as Noam Chomsky and many others have copiously documented, translates into piles and piles and piles of rotting, stinking corpses all over the planet, everywhere but here. Yeah, these are real people. This is a real grinding misery. This is real burning flesh. This is real shredded babies. And not just a few. We're talking now on the scale of millions and perpetually. That's the direct commission and the indirect commission of the same kind of crime, which is made possible by the direct commission, is death by starvation, death by deprivation of medical attention, death by all manner of means, truncations of lifespan, people with 40-year longevity as an entire population, that degree of intensive impoverishment for the raking off, exploitation, whatever you want to call it, of the assets which should make their lives livable. That's the nature of the process, the structure of the reality, and what has been the response. Well, we have petition campaigns, <laughs> we have marches, we have rallies, we read a lot of books, and some of us scribble quite a lot and publish more, make sure the word is out there, defy logic by announcing that we're speaking truth to power as if power didn't know what it was doing. 
somehow. We might wish to consider perhaps speaking to people once in a while, but to what purpose? Well, apparently, so diets can be changed. Okay, we can have more bicycle paths. We can have no smoking signs at every flat surface in California. We can bear moral witness and feel better about ourselves because we're enlightened and aware when we go home from the rally, which did absolutely nothing to change anything tangible in terms of the functioning of power. (laughs) Has to go to a particular end. What I'm going to say here is that once that cycle has been completed, and it's been completed three times in my adult life, Hey, the style show out there for the alternative or counterculture or whatever, they're clear back to tie-dye at this point. My God, those went out when I was in college, and now it's back, and elephant bells. Next thing you know, people are going to be, well, never mind. (laughs) It's become a ritual form where once the list of finite options of the sort that I just talked about are exhausted, producing effect of utter ineffectuality go back to the beginning and start it all over again and when that fails we go back and there's been iteration after iteration after iteration after iteration of that throughout the 20th century on the part of the so-called radical opposition progressive opposition liberal opposition almost all of it coming under a rubric of something called nonviolence. Now, before I get all off into the nature of my critique of this and start making comparisons to Merlin the magician in reliance upon alchemy, that we repeat the same failed experiment long enough, over and over again, eventually that lead will become gold. Uh, Before I get all off into that, let me point out a very important word on the cover of the book. It's a two-letter word. I'm not even going to be obscene here. As. It doesn't say pacifism is pathology. It says pacifism as pathology. And I think it's a fairly important distinction to make. There's nothing in pacifism. And I am, yes I am, going to conflate this articulation of nonviolent principles with pacifism. It's a little crude, but it'll work for purposes here tonight. Pacifism, and any doctrine that I'm aware of that will withstand scrutiny and is worthy of the name, holds that one shall not inflict violence. It says nothing about one will not absorb it. It says nothing about pacifism is synonymous with avoidance of risk. It says nothing about pacifism is synonymous with avoidance of sacrifice. Struggle. There have been pacifists in a tradition of opposition in the United States ever since I was old enough to be aware of it. There was a guy by the name of Norman Morrison who was a practicing Quaker, clear back in 1965 when I was still in high school, went down to the Pentagon to protest what they were setting out to do in Vietnam, introducing maneuver battalions at Da Nang. Poured a can of gasoline over his head, struck a match. Got attention for about four days. Now I absolutely disagree with suicide as a political tactic in almost any instance you can name. I think Norman Morrison was a person with enough talent and enough commitment that he could have had an impact if he had extended his life, but he made that choice. I can disagree with the politic of it. I can disagree with the tactic, but the one thing I cannot do is suggest that Norman Morrison avoided risk, that Norman Morrison avoided sacrifice, that Norman Morrison did not have the courage of his convictions. He most certainly did. And there are others and less extreme, although several examples of that sort from the Vietnam period I could pull up. But at a level of struggle and sacrifice in nonviolent terms, you'd have to look at the Berrigans who courted imprisonment. Absolute defiance, didn't stay safe for a moment. 
And again, I can run down other examples. I can run them down all night if you want. People I've worked with, people I know about. In terms of people I work with, Shara Griffith from Greenpeace, who established a peace camp that physically interposed that group of people between federal marshals and my own group at Yellow Thunder Camp occupation in the early 1980s. And there was substantial risk involved in that because those guys were coming, and what they had in mind to do was something like Waco. And it worked. Had it just been the Indians, and had it just been the armed struggle, where you had had a bloodbath of one sort or another, probably wouldn't have worked out like Waco because we were better prepared for what it was that was coming, apparently, than the people were there. We were not housed in a structure that was subject to being torched and everybody inside burned alive. So it would have played out a little bit different, but by virtue of the fact of a bunch of little white kids, and that's really what it came down to in the minds of the marshal, we're not going to drive an armored personnel carrier over over the top of a bunch of kids who got well-connected and fluent parents who might just get us in a bunch of trouble. So it worked. It worked on the basis of incurring the risk. But that's not how it usually works. It's not how it usually works. It works by way of a certain sort of collaboration with the functioning of power. Because it's well understood that there are certain lines of activity which are not only condoned by the elites, but are considered necessary to demonstrate that this is a functioning democracy. All evidence to the contrary, notwithstanding things having to do with the expression of political speech, so long as you do it in a way that's proved, except it doesn't actually disrupt anything. If you won't do it, they'll come down and ask you to organize it and offer you a grant for the purpose. <laughs> And that reality goes into the definition of the movement of what actually constitutes violence, if you think about it. Consider Seattle. Y'all aware of Seattle, the WTO demonstrations that occurred there? Are you aware that the big to-do among the so-called nonviolent folk was that there were a bunch of youngsters running around wearing black masks and such, called themselves, I think, the Black Bloc. Anybody ever heard of them? The black bloc was being horribly violent. They were breaking the windows in Starbucks coffee houses. Yeah. And so pristine and pure were the advocates of nonviolence in the face of this that people who could never in their wildest imaginings lift a hand to prevent a police officer from doing a damn thing linked arms, supplanted the cops, and manhandled the black blockers away from the windows protecting the corporate property. True story. True story. It's on videotape. Battle of Seattle. Get it out and look at these brave guys defending Starbucks from the violence of a broken window when they were ostensibly there to protest a corporate ravage of the third world that was translating into hundreds of thousands and even millions of deaths. And if you can't see the contradiction in that, you're not looking. At two levels. One, the idea that a personal posture can be assumed that precludes the violence of the context. And the context is violent, that's why you're there. So it's by no means, no matter what you do, going to be a nonviolent context. Get used to it. What I'm talking about in the third world is going to go on every minute of every protest. They're the, supposedly the reasons for the protests. And the cops are wearing those guns in their hips and carrying that chemical mace and that pepper gas, that spray, and those other accoutrements of repression for a reason. You don't make them nonviolent by acquiescing. The violence is systemic and it remains there. Your acquiescence simply perpetuates it. That's at the philosophical level and at the practical level, the idea that somebody who would not oppose a police officer in the process of beating someone half to death with a riot baton could then manhandle a black blocker away from a window kind of speaks for itself. That contradiction has already been remarked. But then the upshot comes on the websites of the movement to do in the aftermath of Seattle. I have one in particular, I won't name the name of the individual, and I doubt that it was a real name that was posted with it anyway, thanking the black bloc a lot, sarcasm dripping, thanks a lot guys for turning Seattle into a fascist state for the duration of your visit here. So let's see, these guys got off the buses from Eugene or wherever it was they were from, okay, and all of a sudden the police chief and the mayor both exhibiting visible shock, 
horrified that these guys were here and knowing they had to take drastic measures to prevent the breaking of Starbucks windows, <laughs> ran out and bought themselves a SWAT team, a couple armored personnel carriers, a whole inventory of tear gas, yeah, got everybody trained and equipped and coordinated to get it out there in the street. That all happened in about 28 minutes and then, <laughs> yeah, comes around somehow or another to the idea and it's a good old American idea. It's kind of like when H. Rap Brown made reference to violence being American as a cherry pie, yeah? So is the notion of blaming the victim. Victims of fascism somehow or another become responsible for the fact of the fascism itself. Damn Jews. If it hadn't been for them, Nazis wouldn't have exterminated them all. Yeah. Maybe you can find a logical defensibility to such propositions, but I can't. Colin Powell, and actually I saw him make this comment on CNN, which I'm a junkie, I get all kinds of good sound bites out of that thing. <laughs> yeah, Colin's standing there saying, as a joke, you know, I'm running out of enemies. I just can't find any more enemies for us to go after this about, uh, I don't know, a year ago. Yeah. As a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, one of the orchestrators of the My Lai Massacre cover-up, which is what propelled his career, and present Secretary of State presiding over a Holocaust out there in the Third World, this was his idea of coming forth with a little levity. But they're quoting him like this is serious. Like, the brass is really running out of targets and demons. And then they come up with an example. Bush's Star War package is going forward to Congress where it could have been expected to meet stiff resistance, meaning they were going to talk about it a lot. <laughs> and it was going to pass anyway. They actually say this. And clearly it wouldn't, you know, the preponderance of it would have been in the end passed anyway. But all of that's over now because of September 11th. I read it, I swear, three times trying to find out what it was that was over. Those people out there who are literally sitting in hovels starving to death, watching their children die of malnutrition and exposure in the masses are supposed to be apparently thrilled that we've actually gotten to the point in this country through no doubt our enlightened pressure by nonviolent tactics to where we can actually stimulate a debate about something that's going to pass anyway in the Congress. And if they should wait contentedly, dying the entire time in absolute misery, while we dither our way through to the point where we can find a pill that we can take that will provide us a painless solution while preserving privilege. Ooh. But if someone has a better means of explaining what it is the expectation is that's being pushed off on these people, I would really like in the aftermath of what it is that I'm saying here to hear about it. I'm subject to re-articulation every once in a while. Someone can give me a better idea, but I haven't come up with a better explanation of what the expectation implicit in that remark might have been. What is it? It was over now. What we have now is a clarification. And the clarification is that if you're serious about actually affecting change, and you're serious about the idea that international law should be binding, and you're serious about the conception that killing masses of other people and starving their babies to death, as a half million Iraqi children have been starved to death in non-wartime conditions over the past 10 years without a murmur of protest worthy of the name in this country. Then you're going to have to understand that in a relative position of disempowerment such as we are, there's no way that what we call a movement or the opposition or anything else can actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the federal government and compel it to do anything at this point. Relatively disempowered in an extreme form as we are now, we do not foreclose any tactical options available to us. None. That's insane and absurd, particularly on the basis of making it a morally superior argument to do so. As to the moral superiority of bearing moral witnesses, while babies die, decade in, decade out, I can find no morality whatsoever, but I can find 
self-interest, I can find self-indulgence, and I find it disgusting to extreme and degree to have that peddled as a morally superior position to people who, in the face of being on the receiving end of that, try to find some means of attracting attention or at least strike back. At least strike back. The old thing about if I'm going to die, which we all will, I would much rather do so on my feet than on my knees. It's kind of binding here. At least those who respond in kind to the rules imposed have the dignity of dying on their own terms rather than those that are imposed by a system and frankly the people in the system who do not consider them as valuable as the toilet paper upon which they wipe their ass. We do not foreclose on any tactical options available to us. We do not have a moral prerogative to foreclose as a moral principle any tactical option available to us in the face of what it is that's actually going on out there, if not here. But you can find it here as well. What it is that's happening in the third world happens in every barrio, every migrant camp, every inner city, every Indian reservation in this country. And it doesn't just restrict itself to communities of color. You can find it in Appalachia as well. It's both a racial ethnic issue and a class issue by a structure that consigns people to the dregs of misery just as a concomitant of doing business and wishes to extrapolate itself in predatory fashion in an even more virulent form upon the remainder of the planet. If there were a serious movement, a serious opposition in this country, which could be relied upon to do its level best to affect fundamental change in this country, one could assume that those in the third world who are bearing the brunt of what it is that's happening might be in a position where they could say, we could give it some more time. We could give it some more time. But such a movement does not presently exist for the reasons that I've already indicated. We have to ask ourselves now what it would be that would be required to create such a movement? Well, the first is a consciousness of what it is that I'm talking about, the non-foreclosure of options. What I'm not doing is making an argument here that everybody should run out and get yourself some Molotov cocktails, get yourself a piece, snipe at the cops, do all those silly things that they are always accusing us of being about doing when we make these kinds of articulations. No, I am saying get yourself intellectually, psychologically prepared. Get yourself equipped, get yourself trained, have available the option to engage in a reflexive and flexible manner to whatever the situation is that presents itself so that you can engage in a reasonable and rational analysis of what it is that might work in any given instance. I believe in armed struggle. I have engaged in armed struggle over the last 20 years and repeated occasions. With that belief in hand, with that experience in hand, my own praxis, probably 95% of it has been of the nature of what would be called nonviolent. I've engaged in petition campaigns. I engage in marches. I engage in protests of various sorts. I engage in boycotts. I engage in all those lines of activity, and I do not restrict myself to that. Thank you very much. In fact, my refusal to restrict myself to that and that of other people with whom I work, their refusal in common with my own, often adds a measure of credibility to the other modes of protest that would otherwise be absent. And I'm not telling people who have moral compunctions against engaging in armed struggle that they need to violate those compunctions, but what you have to do is manifest solidarity rather than condemnation and repudiation for those who don't share those principles. We must operate on a basis of mutual respect. For most people, the question of violence and nonviolence, however, is not a matter of principle. Primarily, the question of nonviolence as opposed to violence is a tactical consideration, the question of what works. What works in any given situation? What is most likely to work? For which investment can you get the most return in capitalist terms? That's a language they understand. The other language is a language they understand as well. They've ultimately exempted themselves as they've convinced the body politic that it had a right to exempt itself from receiving what it is that is dished out by the system. That was what the shock and the ramifications were of 911. 
We need to do a little more careful assessment of what it is that that was about. I might not agree that it was the most effective tactic that could have been undertaken at that particular point, but I frankly for the life of me can't figure out another, much less a better one, people in Afghanistan or Iraq could have engaged. It's not exactly like they have a military parity with the United States. There's a million and a half dead in Iraq and there's a million dead in Afghanistan. How much longer were they supposed to be non-responsive? I've had people debate this with me. Brian Wilson, another whose courage cannot be questioned, chained himself to a railroad track in front of an ordnance depot to stop a flow of arms that was going to the Contra War, as I recall, was run over by the locomotive, got right back up and said the same thing he said before. He tells me his method would be to starve the institutional structure, deny it the transfusions of cash it requires vampire-like in order to exist. On 9-1-1, 19 guys equipped with $30 worth of box cutters did 100 billion, and the count is increasing, dollars worth of damage structurally to the economy of the United States. That was my initial estimate of how much that was going to ripple out to cost. I think I was low. In other words, 19 guys with $30 worth of box cutters did more bleeding of the system in a terms of value that it understands than every boycott and every march and every campaign that we've undertaken since Vietnam. And they did it in about 20 minutes. Now you do your own calculus on this and figure out whether or not, irrespective of whether they had other options available, it was an effective tactic. In their terms, it had to be, and understand, they are not occupying the privileged positions that we occupy, and understand as well, even to make a decision as to what fashion you're going to represent yourself with in public spaces, or whether or not you're going to change your dialect or privileges. People who are in starvation conditions don't have the option of making determinations what the proper diet might be. Whether I'm going to be a macrobiotic, a vegetarian, whether I'm going to subsist entirely on meat or just rice. No, no, we don't get these choices. See, this is a privileged law. We're all privileged, every one of us. And the non-privileged make certain choices according to sets of understandings and imperatives that we don't happen to necessarily share. And we've got to get used to that, too, on the basis of that exercise of mutual respect, try to understand where it is they're coming from. In the process, we might just learn something in a less abstract way that we've been tend to assimilate thus far. You understand? Actually, at that point, other than to make the observation, the people who want to make the argument that the other route, that route of repeating the same failed experiments over and over again on a basis of some presumption of personal moral purity, and that they are, in fact, being more effective in the long run than people who take direct action of the sorts that occurred in 911, and I'm not suggesting that that need be repeated, are functioning in a level of absolute duplicity is one possibility, or to cut them more slack, I suppose, on the basis of a delusional self-awareness. Delusional in terms of self, which then precipitates a delusional understanding of the reality they inhabit and engage. And to be delusional is to be curable, but it is not to be in a position of making a determination of the tactical responses appropriate to people who are not. Thank you. With that all said, I think the position that I wanted to take has been pretty well lined out. And with you, thus stimulated to reply in kind or in contrary fashion, I think I'll stop impersonating a talking head up here, step back, take a drink of water, and let's get to it. Thank you very much for listening.
pacifistic nature than September 11th. Like, uh, things, there's, it seems like there's so much that could be done in terms of effectively attacking the system that, uh, that wouldn't entail suicide, that wouldn't entail uh, murdering, like, you know, well, there are lots of simple little tactics that could be easily repeated to, uh, to cause probably as much damage with less risk and less, less sacrifice, more joy. You know, I, I don't want to, I don't wish to be singling out the, the actions of the left as, like, exemplary act, you know? Okay, that's what you think, and you sort of, in a very ambiguous and vague form, laid out why. But since you said there must be tactics that would blah, 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 name one. I would say movements. You, you use movements, not a tactic. Movements, something you build in some fashion or another. We got movements all over the place. We got alphabet soup in terms of parties to go with the movements. We got all that. The question is what those movements are going to do. That's what tactics are about, and tactics are a fulfillment of a strategy. What's your strategy? There's all kinds of, of sabotage actions that are taken by people on, on a regular basis that maybe don't get quite as much attention, but do cause a fair amount of damage, and um, people don't necessarily have to get caught, etc., or, or die in doing it. I guess I'm just pointing out. Let me ask you a question. Are you morally outraged and opposed to the hanging of Adolf Eichmann by the state of Israel for his commanding participation in the Holocaust? I don't really see how that's relevant, no. Well, I'll explain how it's relevant. Just tell me how you feel about it. I think there's somebody else answering for this guy now. I do believe in collectivity, but let the man speak for himself. Okay, unless he's got a tapeworm. He's... No, I said I'm not. I said I'm not more, but, and I'm not really, you know, I, no, okay, no, so no, I'm not, whatever. You're not morally outraged, okay. Then I suppose I would ask you the question, but that would be getting rhetorical at this point of what's the difference. But the way I'll frame it is, how else do you bring all these little Eichmanns who will be sitting on the upper floors of that building to some kind of justice? Little sabotage acts? Yes, I know there were janitors there, and there were a couple kids in those airplanes. And I feel bad about the janitors, and I feel bad about the kids. I don't feel one bit worse about those two kids that were on the aircraft, though, than those half million Iraqi babies who keep getting shoveled back while we talk about the innocence in the World Trade Center. Thus far. Thus far. And how exactly you arrived at your analysis that had there been a quantitative increase in the magnitude of suffering in the third world kind of escapes me. It may change its pace, it may change its focus, but like water, it's going to seek its own level, and that level has been relatively constant, including during the Vietnam period. It did not go up appreciably because of the armed aggression that the United States was engaged in in Southeast Asia. What you have to understand is, is this horror show is a constant out there. And we had an anti-war movement as long as it was an engagement of U.S. troops in Southeast Asia in a direct sense, partly because they were conscripting people and sent them over there so they could end up being casualties. That was a major incentive in having an anti-war movement, but it wasn't the only one. But with the withdrawal of U.S. ground troops, that anti-war movement diminished. In 1975, when the United States was still refusing, as it is today, to pay reparations that it agreed to at Geneva, there was no protest whatsoever. And everybody was supposedly calculating and calibrating their tactics and were motivated by the well-being of the people on the receiving end over in Southeast Asia, but their well-being wasn't even part of the calculus by the time it got to the aftermath of it. It was just eclipsed from consciousness. Such as the incipient anti-war movement during the Gulf War was just beginning to get off the ground and then the war was over and it went away. Well, there have been a half million Iraqi children die as a result of the ongoing U.S. intervention in the years since, and you've frankly seen more attention committed to 
installing additional speed bumps in suburban neighborhoods than the fate of those children. Well, this can serve the purpose if we stop repudiating and shoving it away like it's something that's horror. Hey, there's a message in this. Let's get the message and let's articulate the message rather than join the cheering section of CNN to explain how it was an unmitigated evil. And I know you didn't use that term, but we get close. I'm seeing all kinds of coverage now of the fate of Afghani women. And I'm not insensitive to the fate of Afghani women. I'm not a cheering leader for the Taliban. But I find it kind of peculiar in progressive circles there's a sudden interest in the fate of Afghani women when there hadn't been. Taliban's been around a while. Unremarked upon until all of a sudden there was a need to rationalize U.S. intervention and somehow the left is doing its part to make the rationalization stick by saying, well, they were bad people and look, it's better to lot of the women. Believe that to Ted Koppel and people in the mass media. We don't need to do their work for them, but we are. We are. We need a sharp analysis, a clear analysis. If we're going to build a movement, as was suggested, it needs to be based upon principles of clarity of understanding, among other things. And this isn't going in that direction. Okay. To recapitulate. Don't, don't make it any longer. I've got to repeat it. <laughs> is I'm operating on the assumption, which I've neither tested nor may be testable, that the 19 people alleged to have done what was done on the 11th actually did it. And she sees the interest primarily, I think you said exclusively, the interest served by what happened were the people that we're up against. Is that about it? Knuckle-headed Americans have always been starting to get a clue about everything for as long as I've been alive, and it just never translates into anything, okay? But i got to ask you, and I sort of see what you're saying, and you're correct. I am relying on the news media, and that's always a sort of a tenuous proposition. But what are you suggesting since the beneficiaries of the government of the United States that they put operatives of their own in these aircraft and flew them into the World Trade Center in the Pentagon in order to get legitimation from even more draconian, repressive activities against everybody. On that score, you're probably on firm ground. Okay, okay, okay. I, I still have to recapitulate what you say, so you can't make a too long a detailed a thing. Uh, <laughs> the thing I just said, which I consider to be absurd when I put it out there, was accepted at face value as saying it make as much sense as any explanation has been put out there, and even assuming it's correct that it was Al-Qaeda which did this, well, I think you said Taliban, it's still our own operatives coming back because it created both Taliban and, by extension, Al-Qaeda. And there is definitely a truth to that, although I don't think there was a conspiracy in the federal government to knock down the World Trade Center and fly a plane into the Pentagon, per se. They're trying to spin it to their advantage. Obviously, that is the most predictable thing in the world for them to do. We're not going to have a debate. <laughs> okay, there's many things they would likely do and are on record as having done by way of provocation and creating the appearance organization they wish to discredit and engage in certain kinds of activities. But knocking down the World Trade Center is not likely to be on the list of things they do in order to generate a public response of a certain sort. For one thing, they took out in virtually its entirety the top international bond trading firm in the world. 700 of those people were top, top scale bond traders. I mean, it's not simply the material cost of this. 
It's a technical expertise, and that was the nature of my reference a while ago to Eichmann. These were the technicians to make the new world order function in economic terms, and they were not going to sacrifice them that gratuitously in order to do something they were already doing in a more open way. So you look at this anti-terrorism package they came down with, and it's draconian. It is harsh. It licenses them to do virtually anything they want to repress political activities of virtually anyone they want. And guess what? They already were. Just a question of who you were. It's like the idea that somehow or another the black blockers coming to town made Seattle into a fascist state by way of its police. It depends on which neighborhood in Seattle you lived in. Okay, whether you were that removed from the reality of the police is to not know they were already a fascist state. There's a certain calculus that goes into this, and the nonviolence proponents might pay attention to it. The more the degree that you're considered tangibly threatening to the stable functioning of the state is the more the degree of repression that will be visited upon you. I don't know too many people out there with picket signs and stuff that are visited with very much repression. Decoded, that simply means you're not doing a damn thing to disrupt the functioning of the state and perhaps even furthering it by creating a false image of how it functions, a liberal image, okay? If you're actually tangibly disrupting anything, you're going to be visited with the kind of repression that they just codified as applicable to everybody. But it was at their discretion. They made a determination who it was that would be targeted with it based upon perceived threat anyway, which meant, theoretically at least, everybody was subject to it to begin with. So what this has done is clarified an existent situation, which is another benefit if it's articulated that way. We can see things a little more clearly now. The lines are being drawn, and they're drawing them. And it's not just here. This is global. The United States extends its jurisdiction in this sense globally, and they're saying so straight out. But they've been doing that for a long time anyway, and it's always a matter of confusion and in debate. Well, there's nothing to debate. They just put it in black-letter legal form. It didn't change the material reality. It changed the surface impression in such a way that we can actually use it to our advantage in terms of explaining the terms of combat here and link it to the terms of combat there in a much more concrete way than it seems to have been done in the past. Well, the point it was made was this really did turn into a September 11th event, didn't it? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. September 11 confused everybody, everybody including the movement. And I would submit that anyone that was confused by September 11th was already so confused that, <laughs> all right. What we got is a weird kind of American exceptionalism of the left, of the opposition. It's the same thing as it is... The right. America is subject to a different set of rules and a different set of standards and a different everything. Those things that happen out there, we can understand them. They're appropriate out there. We understand them and see the appropriateness everywhere but here. You got the Israelis firing artillery to provoke the Palestinians across the border in Lebanon in the early 18, 80s before the invasion of Lebanon by Israel. Okay, the first time the Palestinians let it go. So what the Israelis do? They intensified it and fired again. This time they got a response. Now he's talking about how this has played out in the media and all the rest. The one thing he's not doing is telling them it's an inexcusable terrorist response on the part of the Palestinians. And aside from the fact that what got hit this time was in this country rather than some other country, there's no real difference tangibly between the two examples. That after 10 years of patient waiting for a movement to get itself together and decide it was more important to save the lives of Iraqi children than to remove ashtrays from a restaurant in the Bay Area. They finally took matters in their one hand through, what they call them, three 300,000 pound cruise missiles into about the best target you could possibly have picked in any point in the United States. Okay. And in the process, extracted a toll 
primarily composed of the technocrats that I was talking about, not exclusively so. There's going to be what the United States calls some collateral damage on any action that is taken. That's unfortunate, but those are terms that were imposed by the United States. And in that process, extracted a revenge, if you want to look at it that way, of 1% of the Iraqi children alone. I still don't hear anybody talking about the Iraqi children. I hear all kinds of variations on bemoaning the fate of those 5,000 innocent people who were the primary investment bankers and bond traders and so forth and those top rungs. I mean, I, I've been running through those obituaries in the New York Times and I've found one receiving clerk so far. I'll count you the, in the EMTs and the firemen, okay. But so far, I've counted well over half of all the casualties at the World Trade Center alone as being in the Eichmann capacity. And I've even had people try to argue that those in the Pentagon were innocent bystanders as well. I mean, my God, if you can't hit the Pentagon, what can you hit? <laughs> By that standard of logic, it would have been a crime against humanity for the Viet Cong or the NVA to have fired mortar rounds into a U.S. compound because, after all, there were Vietnamese house girls, as they were called, hooch girls, okay, and Papa Son who burned the crap. And those were, of course, innocent civilians. Are you telling me you actually got a, an ethic that says that the Viet Cong and the NVA were engaged in impermissible activities because they engaged in a military defense against a military invasion? Well, it's military to those people over there. Just because this is a self-exempted zone where the same rules don't apply does not actually stand up for the rest of the world. And whether or not they're terrified by U.S. air power at this moment, you can trust me on this one. The bulk of the world is saying it's about time. And if you guys had done it another way on your own in some sense, and I'm not saying you guys to you people, I'm saying that's what they're saying to all of us. If you've been effectual in some sense, at some point, this might not have been necessary. But as it stands, it was absolutely necessary, and it was absolutely empowering, even if they get beat, that they actually drew blood where it counted, because it's their blood being shed in a continuous hemorrhage out there. Unnoticed. No one cares. No one really cares. There's this whole predication in America about innocence being paid to we didn't know. We didn't know about those 500,000 Iraqi children. There have been two UN commissioners resigned back to back. One went on a speaking tour in North America saying that he had resigned in protest to the policy of deliberate genocide imposed upon Iraq by the United States. This was reported in the New York Times for three weeks. Madeleine Albright went on 60 Minutes and the question was posed. We've been hearing from the UN commissioners about these 500,000 children. What's the truth to this? She said, yeah, it's as near as I can tell, pretty accurate. We decided it was worth the cost. There's a difference between not knowing and not caring. And if you're out there on the receiving end of that and get the response that you saw in this country to those statements, the only conclusion you could possibly draw is that nobody cares. Okay, what do we do now? We're going to rely on those guys to mount a movement that's going to put a stop to this? Yeah. By the time pigs fly. Understand, the days of immunity and self-exemption from the costs and consequences of what's dished out are over. That message was sent loud and clear. And those people worried about those children on those aircraft are your own children or me for mine. I probably fly more than anybody in this room, so I'm probably in proportionately more subject to being turned into a passenger on one of those cruise missiles. And so be it. If you want your children to be safe, stop killing other people's babies or looking the other way while they die. See, that's a real simple message. It can be understood by anybody from the bowling alley to Pittsburgh to PhD level faculty members at the University of California at Berkeley. Nobody's confused about it, and we can put that message out off of this. They gave us the opportunity to do something different. And I'm not entirely convinced myself they don't have the capacity to drop the other foot if this keeps up, and there isn't a coherent response that is of the right sort, and that is the right sort. 
See, it's the line from Lawrence Sampson out of Cotton Club. I'll go off into movies now. We'll do a little cultural studies moment. <laughs> All right? It was that simple a message that got missed because of this exceptionalist attitude that's been taken in all quarters in this society. Now, Fishburne was playing a real-life 1930s Harlem gangster by the name of Bumpy Johnson, who, when they desegregated the Cotton Club, went to the guy who was the bouncer who had persecuted black people for all the years when they were excluded. Took a delight in it, and the entertainers, too. Took the guy, slammed his head up against the wall, stuck his head in the toilet, and flushed. Pulled him back out and said, what you don't understand and you got to learn, is when you push people around, somebody's going to push back. <laughs> Cotton Club, I'll bet you want it. <laughs> Same character. Okay, he liked playing the part so much in Cotton Club, he made a whole movie about it. I don't talk about September 11. I have a question. Okay. It's okay. In Just fine. In why it was wrong and why it didn't work out and, and lives lost and, and people in, incarcerated and how this ended up being bad. But more specifically, when violence is, when the right kind of violence is the right kind of tactic at the right time and finding those weak spots in an already existing system and exploiting that, and that's kind of very much the theory that I believe in, and I guess I just wanted to hear you talk more about that. <coughs> Elaborate on what you started with and run with it a little more. Okay. Ed Mead in the introduction to pacifism as pathology. And for those who don't know, Ed Mead was an individual who engaged in armed struggle in the 1970s, was apprehended, convicted, and did 20 some odd years. I, I don't remember exactly how long. It was an eternity in maximum security as a result and came out just before the book was put together and wrote this. He did not, however, say at any point that armed struggle was wrong. He also doesn't refer to it as violence, armed struggle his armed struggle, okay? What he said was that there had been miscalculations on the part of the group that he was a participant in and maybe more broadly in the movement as to the propriety and emphasis that should be played on, placed on armed struggle at a particular point in the early 1970s when he went down. And that that was counterproductive. It was counterproductive in a couple of ways, not least of which was a bunch of people who were seriously committed, unswervingly committed, as a matter of fact, ended up dead or in cages as a result, and the movement lost those, and it also intimidated people who weren't as clear in their politics as the people who were engaged in the armed struggle. And so there's questions of context that have to be raised. What's the condition of the consciousness of the movement at the time when something is considered? What is it that you hope to achieve by it? And that has to be clearly understood, and does the potential cost, it, okay, because you can always lose people. You have to just factor that in. Are you going to gain more than you're likely to lose by it? It's a real military kind of calculus. It's also a political calculus. Can you explain what happened in terms that will lead to a greater clarity of consciousness among people who are not yet politically engaged? Do you have the possibility of doing that in any broad sense? Or will it be something appropriated and articulated back through the edifice of mass media and so on in a way that is entirely contrary to itself and counterproductive in that sense. Well, those implicate a bunch of things. And no, I cannot give you a situation analysis because I don't have a situation to give you an analysis of. Okay? Not specific. And it is very specific. It's contextually specific. It has to be something that arises out of the immediacy of the conditions one confronts. One not only as an individual, but one as a group as well. Okay, you get a broader movement than that, then you get the interactivity and there's a greater degree of complexity. And as I say, these tactical considerations fit into an overall strategy. What are you trying to accomplish overall in the end? How does this fit into it? You're looking to reform the state so it's kinder, gentler, fascist, imperialist power? Or you want to abolish it? I mean, that's a fundamental kind of question. Yeah. Well, in your case, maybe I get that clarity. <laughs> but if I said nine people, probably this is not a representative sample in this room. <laughs> okay? 
of, I said, nine random people who identify themselves as somehow or another being a part of the movement, however we're going to define it, because it seems a multiplicity of special interests that are each operating out there. Is, since somebody, some brilliant soul, probably a postmodernist of some sort, announced that there was no hierarchy of oppression, okay, makes all forms of oppression equal, everyone, ev yeah, right. So since I'm oppressed by smokers, my combat against ashtrays is equivalent to your combat against genocide, and probably you should come over and spend some time with me anyway because it's more important because it's here. <laughs> yeah, you get this kind of step. They're not real clear what the end of game goal is supposed to be. Well, we've got a whole lot of consciousness work that goes into that, but the consciousness work cannot be a mutually not mutually exclusive, self-contained process. That's the bit about we read a lot of books, and then we write a lot of books, make sure everybody's informed continuously, I don't know, speaking truth to power, and we end up like homie Baba, announcing that writing is actually akin to warfare. In fact, writing is warfare. In fact, writing is the only valid kind of warfare because all the rest of them are going to be subject to these class analysis and critiques and there's always going to be this unrepresentative quality to it. You really can't engage in anything that's not counterproductive and still scribble on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we've got a lot of sharpening to do. <laughs> all right. But it has to be a practical kind of sharpening, which is not just an intellectual thing and not just well, hey, let's go out and burn the SUVs in a car lot kind of thing. We're here to fuck things up. Doesn't quite provide enough analysis for most people. Okay. <laughs> We've got to take the theory and inform the practice. And from the practice, learn how to alter the theory and have that kind of thing going. But with a clarity that we really do want to affect a fundamental change, which means an abolition of the existing structure. That's the only fundamental change that's at hand. So no, we don't get them to pass a new rule that prevents somebody from doing something that we don't like. And no, we don't get a new rule to keep them from putting something in the food that we don't like. And no, you know, we're not going to go to the legislature and lobby. And no, we're not probably going to get an ultimate solution by going to court and filing a suit. You know? And when you get done by process of elimination taking out the things that aren't going to lead in that direction in the end, although they may have at any given moment a certain tactical expediency, we may engage in litigation, we may engage in lobbying, not as be all end all that it's going to achieve our result, but it leads towards that purpose of actually having a thing undone, in pieces, gone, and something else in its place. Long, long time in this country before I encountered that kind of consciousness in any particular broad sense as opposed to confusion that has to do with the nature of the discourse that has to do with the, the nature of self-indulgence sense of privilege it's repudiated it still exists and I'll own it too the question was could I point to historical organizations that in my opinion have been effective Okay? And in varying ways. Obviously, none of them have been effective enough because we're still in this country, okay? But in slices and in moments from which we can learn both what it is they did right and what it was that was done wrong, and defects in the broader base of support is a big one there, and that needs to be owned. Okay, we have critiques of an organization that was created right here in Oakland, California called the Black Panther Party. Okay? The Black Panther Party accomplished some amazing things in a three-year period of time, all right? And as a result of the amazing things it accomplished, it was targeted, who? Seriously targeted for elimination by the federal government, and all of a sudden you heard this wild, I mean, it was like birds chirping out there in a the forest, thousands of them all singing a different tune, you know? All the excuses and prevarications and critiques of the Black Panthers and what was wrong with their practice and how they weren't representative and how they were macho and then, yeah. And that's why we can't support them. In other words, distance ourselves, isolate them, and let the feds eat them alive. I could accuse the movement that got put so back of my day 
This isn't even contemporary. This is when I was on the so-called cutting edge and young and all of that, of gross cowardice. This isn't even faulty analysis. This is contriving an analysis to cover your cowardice. It's what that came down to on a mass scale. And that's glorified at this point. There's only now beginning to be some serious reconsideration, rehabilitation of Black Panther Party, which actually achieved something as opposed to all those chatterers out there who were creating propaganda for the state to discredit the party, to excuse their running off and staying safe from it. Okay, who never did a damn thing, went nowhere. That's one. American Indian Movement was one. Period of wounded knee. Hell, half this country seriously believed Indians were extinct right along with the buffalo. American Indian Movement put American Indians back in the American framework of consciousness, big time. Major accomplishment. You could go back to the industrial workers of the world, take a completely different kind of example. You got an actual labor movement, union, radical politics that is bent upon abolition of the existent system that had over a million members done in by the labor movement in concert with the feds. There have been examples that we could pull from. I could go on. Black Liberation Army in a different way still. F-A-L-N. Macheteros. There's examples. Thing is, those that were successful in defining their terms were primarily armed formations. And in that sense, self-defeating, okay, because in prematurely perhaps adopting an armed cant. They cut themselves off in a mass movement that was not prepared or refusing of the consciousness that was required to give the fish a sea in which to swim. Now basically each one of these organizations was destroyed by the refusal of the broader movement to support it. And by that I don't mean participating in its armed actions, but by refusing it the kind of support that would allow it to survive. Sanctuary, for example. Propaganda that would justify and explain what it is that they were engaged in so that the broader body politic would understand it. Things like that. Things like that. So you hand them over to Ted Koppel and wonder why nobody could understand what it is they were trying to do or say. Yeah. I think... I agree with you. What was said was a single action of the nature of 911 is insufficient in and of itself to accomplish anything much beyond. Well, is that fair? Anything much beyond itself? Yeah, I, I think that's a general drift of what you had to say. It needs to be followed up by actions probably not on the same scale. And I think I already said that. I don't know that it needs to be repeated. I think it changed the calculus of a lot of things for a lot of people that are not a part of this community, but are on the receiving end of what is done in order to make this community possible, okay? And I don't think we should discount the ramification that effect, okay? But with that said, I think you did a brilliant job of giving yourself a homework assignment. Because you're right, it does need to be followed up. That's the whole point. So get busy, all right? <laughs> And that's open to everybody and inclusive of me. And in that sense, it was exemplary. Not exemplary in the sense it sets a template of things that we have to do. We're not going to repeat 911. Nor do we necessarily have to. What we have to do is make it clear that this isn't a simple, abstract debating game. We're here, we'll play by this polite set of rules and express our moral anguish. Well, those who are doing what they're doing that we're expressing the anguish about continue to do what they're doing so that we can be properly anguished. No, the point is, look, you got to stop. And if you don't stop, bad things are going to happen. And here's this taste. Now, if you don't want that to happen again, stop. Oh, you didn't stop. Here's another taste. Okay, you didn't stop. Another taste. Ready to stop yet? And I, I'm sort of being flip about this, but it's kind of the way it works. 
And it comes off exactly what you said. But why is it just the people out there who are most remote and absent resources and all the rest of stuff, not proximate to the belly, the center of the power, I was going to say the belly of the beast, the centers of power from which this emanates, why is it always a burden they carry? Makes much more sense that the burden be carried by those who say they act and stand in solidarity with the suffering out there, huh? Well, if you're actually in solidarity with them, do something tangible to make it stop. Prayer vigils are real nice, and I like lit candles in the night as much as anybody else, but it's never, ever in the history of humanity been known to stop a bullet. It's never been known to feed a child. It's never been known to have the least suasive effect on those in power. It does, however, make those who do it feel better, apparently. (laughs) I got a humble proposition to offer the group. Let's feel better after we win. (laughs) Okay? (laughs) Then we can have a party. In a sort of a sci-fi or fantasy scenario, you've conceived of some, some thing out there that could eradicate this whole monstrosity. Only to confront the realization that would mean that you'd have to go with it. But wouldn't that be arithmetically or mathematically acceptable? Because wouldn't the planet as a whole be much better off without us all? (laughs) Whoa. The system that's destroying the Well, yeah, if you want to identify with the system in some fatalistic and disempowered fashion, say there's ultimately nothing I can do to change it, okay? Yeah, if it was some static entity of what, in which you were embedded, truly, everyone and everything would be better off without it, you, me, all of it, okay? It's our only hope of redemption in more ways than one, is to engage in a process consciously and otherwise that allows us to be empowered to the point that we can actually challenge in in the process of confronting transform power into something other than it is. This system cannot be allowed to sustain itself. Okay. It cannot. It must be destroyed. That doesn't mean that every human component part of it has to go along with it. (laughs) Which is to say, I ain't Paul Pot. Okay. I can conceive of other options. Does that mean the process is a painless one? No, it doesn't. It's not painless now. There's probably a lot of the people in this room that can make personal testimony to the fact that the nature of the existent social, political, and economic reality is not painless. Well, let me tell you, you get outside of this country or into some other communities besides the one that we're sitting in here together tonight, and that quantitative and qualitative experiencing a pain goes up astronomically. It's not a painless situation. There's going to be pain involved in changing it, but guess what? There's pain involved in not changing it. Yeah? The pain can be alleviated by eliminating its source. And that's probably the only way you alleviate the pain in the end. There is not a way of alleviating the pain by eliminating the source, however, that preserves the privileges of those who benefit from its existence. That's what I meant about there's not a pill that can be taken that will bring about a painless resolution while preserving the privilege of those who are seeking such a solution. Americans are not as a rule, entitled to what they got. And that includes those workers who are just so oppressed that they cannot possibly pay attention to the fact that there's something more important in the world than their bowling score. American workers, as compared to the working class of other countries, while we're talking in terms of class solidarity, are the most overindulged group of people the planet's ever seen. And the fact that they feel oppressed because they can't have a new $40,000 pickup truck and the mortgage is overbearing because they decided that they had to live in an eight-bedroom suburban ranch house. I mean, they don't build houses in this country anymore. It's partly because they got yo-yos that'll mortgage themselves into eternity in order to buy something that's three times the size of anything they might possibly need. (laughs) And 
And I can't accept that as being oppression in any sense that's comprehensible to me in the first place. It's more like choice, and that's problem, okay? Much less that it's the kind of, even if it is oppressive because they're deluded in the choice, and that's a, as a result of advertising and media manipulation, it's the kind of oppression that entitles them to turn away from starving babies. Sorry. And that argument was actually advanced. The reason the working class is so right-wing here is because they're so oppressed. Well, I'm not denying oppression. I'm not denying oppression at all. But this oppression is, well, the term that got to be real popular about 10 years ago, this is an oppression that is created by the hierarchy. The hierarchy. And that's the same people who tell me there's no hierarchy to oppression. If the oppression is being visited upon you by a hierarchy, how in the hell could it avoid being hierarchical? <laughs> yeah? And since there is a hierarchy of oppression, on the hierarchy of oppression, this oppression doesn't count for very much as compared to the oppression with which they ought to be concerned. And another point that was raised a little while ago that I never really did address because I got a little irritated <laughs> was I'm not actually making a moral argument. I'm responding to a moral argument, so the nature of my response is going to assume those terms because of the assertion of moral superiority on the part of those who would be self-neutralizing. Okay? I know babies are dying just as well as you do, but I burned a candle about it, and therefore I'm more superior too. Oh, yeah. Right. That's the terms of the discourse. I didn't create it. I think there's material reasons to do this. There's moral reasons as well, but morality is a variable thing. It's kind of personal. So I won't impose mine on you. The only thing I demand in return is you don't impose yours on me. I think with that in mind, there's a lot of principles that we can agree upon. Like it ain't right by whatever calculus you want to employ to finance cappuccinos and BMWs off starving kids in the third world. I think we can all agree on that, okay? If they'd flown the planes at midnight, the building would have been full of cleaning personnel. Well, they would have hit all those... As a hypothetical? No, actually I wouldn't in this case because... They were targeting those people I referred to as little Eichmanns who are making the world economic system hum to the service of the United States and at their expense. These were legitimate targets in the terms that have been imposed. Yes, I know there were some janitors in the building. There were some food service workers. There were probably some people getting off the subway and so on. I don't think they were appropriately targeted. As a matter of fact, I don't think they were targeted at, at all. The upper floors of those buildings were occupied primarily by Cantor Fitzgerald. Cantor Fitzgerald. Yeah, that's actually the bond trading firm that it took out one third of its overall personnel and the cream of its bond traders. One fell swoop. That's who were waving their shirts out the windows because they had the upper floors all the way up. Being an uh, international bond trader is some, something they fill out of manpower, you know. These people had 20 and 30 years, some of them, invested in being the most competent people in the world. And they're not replaceable in the immediate sense. It's not to say they're not replaceable, okay, just not in the immediate sense. There was a serious blow done in what is uh, Colin Powell's term? Infrastructure. This is command and control infrastructure, okay. Not too How about we make all those starving babies just symbolic? Yeah. Then we can respond just symbolically. Okay. But that's, that's a variation on the exceptionalism. You impose real terms and real suffering on people and you want symbolic responses exclusively. No. That game's over here. And I didn't do that. I'm just reporting. On September 11th, American exceptionalist self-exemption from the terms imposed upon the rest of the planet came to an end. And for that, the people who did it owe no apology whatsoever. 
which is not an argument to the Taliban. I'm not a particular Taliban supporter, and I'm not a fan of bin Laden. Doesn't matter. Doesn't have to be my hero. Okay? The action was correct, given the circumstances that were created here, both by the elites who inflict the pain and by the purported opposition, which really tangibly does nothing to end it, except in the process of its ritual form, separate itself in its own mind from those who comprise the elites and feel better about themselves. Well, that's taking people who are the beneficiaries of the Holocaustal process and making them even more comfortable in their own terms, terms they devise for themselves. I'm not quite sure they're entitled to that comfort. That's just a personal assessment. That's not a political rule. But that's kind of what I meant about, hey, let's feel good and have the party after we win. And we're not going to win by symbolic exercises. We, in what was extrapolated a while ago, is a global sense. But I want to know if there is this class solidarity between these oppressed workers here and anybody in Afghanistan, why there's been absolutely nothing about Afghanistan, even in the alternative press, for the last 10 years, while all that oppression is now being hands wrung about, was going on. Very infrequent. With all of that said, I would like to thank you all very much for being here. It's been real.